sovereignty. I think in this passage you have one of the most shocking statements in the Bible. Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings. Can you think of a more astonishing claim? We rejoice in our sufferings. Uh, We don't seek them. Suffering is never pleasant. But nonetheless, we rejoice in our sufferings. And I want to ask, how, Paul? Tell us how can we rejoice in our sufferings? Uh, Before I read you God's word, let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you for your inerrant word. Seal its truths to our hearts that we might be strengthened to live to the praise of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. It was one of the most remarkable places I've ever preached. In 1995, I preached at a leper colony in Suriname. And in that leper colony... Uh, It was almost entirely older people. Uh, The benefits of drugs that uh, prevent the disease had come too late to spare them of its dreadful effects. And so as I looked out and preached, I saw people whose uh, ears had been eaten away by leprosy, their nose, their lips. There were scars on their hands, on uh, on their arms. You know, when you have leprosy, it uh, renders you insensitive to pain. You put your arm down on the stove. Uh, You don't know you did that until you smell the burning flesh. And so I looked out at these people who in their bodies bore the scars of that terrible disease. And uh, they were the happiest group of Christians I believe I've ever met. Uh, They were in a psalm singing only uh, colony. And uh, they were singing the psalms by heart, and after the service was concluded, uh, they came up and hugged me, welcomed me warmly in the name of Jesus Christ. And all I wanted to say is, brothers and sisters, tell me how you learned to rejoice in your sufferings. And I believe they learned to rejoice in their sufferings uh, because they uh, paid close attention uh, to what the Apostle Paul said when he said here, in this particular passage, we rejoice in our sufferings. And so I want us uh, this morning, as I read this text, for us to pay attention to Paul's exhortation to us. So hear God's word. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And here ends the scripture lesson, and this is the word of the Lord. We rejoice in our sufferings. I know that wherever I preach, it doesn't matter what part of the world, uh, in front of me are suffering men and women. And so I know whenever we talk about suffering, the message is timely. And what I want you to know this morning is that you can rejoice in your sufferings. But for you to rejoice in your sufferings, you must take three truths to heart. First, you can rejoice in your sufferings because of who you are right now. Right now, you are a justified believer. Now, look with me at verse 1. Paul says, since we have been justified by faith. Justification, a legal word. It comes right out of the courtroom. You stand before the judge, and he renders one of two verdicts. Either you are justified, you are right with the law, you have met its requirements, or you are condemned. Uh, You have broken the law, and you are subject to its penalties. And right now, God says you are justified. The same verdict that he pronounced on Abraham 
the former idolater, you are justified. He says that to you as your faith is in Jesus Christ. To David, the adulterer and murderer, God said, you are justified. And that same verdict of justification has been pronounced on you. Uh, that's the very heart of the gospel, uh, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross bore the condemnation that we deserved. And that same Lord Jesus Christ that shed his blood for us, as we take hold of him by faith, his righteousness is counted as ours. Theologians have written volumes about the righteousness that becomes ours through faith in Jesus Christ. But all that the youngest child needs to know is, when I put my hand in Jesus' hand, everything is right between me and God. Justification. Christ has borne our condemnation on the cross. Justification. His righteousness is counted as ours. We love to sing about it. Not just the Methodist, but all of us. Uh, we, 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 we love to sing about it. My, my, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, his cross, uh, his righteousness imputed to us. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress, fully absolved through these I am from sin and fear and guilt and shame. The terrors of the law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and his blood hide all my transgressions from view. Justification, it's at the heart of the gospel. And the Apostle Paul tells us that we have been justified by faith. And you can rejoice in your sufferings because of who you are right now, a justified believer. Now look at what you have as a justified believer. Look again at verse 1. It says we have peace with God through our Lord and Jesus Christ. Peace with God. You can put your head on your pillow at night and know that your sins are forgiven. But how dire was your situation before you knew Christ? Well, Paul tells us, look at verse 10. He says there that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Now, when Paul says we were, uh, that while we were enemies, uh, he does not mean our enmity against God. Now, that's a reality. Uh, our hostility to God that is ours by nature. Uh, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, as Pastor Jones pointed out earlier hostile uh, to God. We are his enemies in that sense, that's true. But here what Paul means in verse 10 is that God looks upon us in our fallenness, in our sin, and God declares us to be his enemies. Uh, back in the 1920s and the 1930s, the FBI had its most wanted list. Uh, you remember reading about that, Babyface Nelson, Alvin Carpus, John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, these were declared to be public enemies. And it was the task of law enforcement agencies, track them down, apprehend them, if you must kill them, but they are enemies of our nation. And we learn here that we were on God's enemies list uh, before he reconciled us to himself through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, you have to know the bad news uh, before you can come to cherish the good news that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, so as a justified believer, uh, you have peace with God and you also have access with God. Look again with me at, uh, or look with me at verse two. Uh, there Paul writes, uh, through him, through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Uh, zero in on that word access. Uh, think about a, a citizen of a country that is granted an audience with his king. Uh, that's access. Uh, taken into the very throne room of the king. And the wonderful news of the gospel is that God takes the justified believer 
and welcomes him into his throne room, uh, not just as a forgiven sinner, but as a precious and dear child of the living God. And there we can pour out our hearts uh, to our Savior. We have access uh, into the very throne room of God. Now, I uh, used to live in New England, lived in New England for 14 years, and my two most cherished possessions while I lived there was my uh, King James Bible and my uh, season pass to Fenway Park. Now, I, I, I cherish the, uh, yeah, I see a Yankees fan over here. I, 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 uh, I, 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 I cherish, um, I, I cherish much more my King James Bible, but I did love having that season pass to Fenway Park. Uh, I could take a friend along with me, and I would go to Gate D uh, with my son, who loved Red Sox baseball. I'd go to Gate D, hold up my card to the attendant, and say, he's with me. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ enters into the throne room of the Father, sits at his right hand, and then he points to all of us, those for whom Christ died, and says, these are with me. Through Christ, we have access to the Father. And tonight, or this morning, my prayer for you is that you will rejoice in your suffering. I know that there are those of you who have come to this week together, this special time of fellowship, and you're hurting. Uh, you're in a difficult place. You're in relationships, perhaps, that are strained. Your health is not what you would like for it to be. You have pressures upon you, pressures inside you. You're suffering. And what I want for you is what Paul says can be our possession. You can rejoice in your suffering because of who you are right now, a justified believer. That's our great theme this morning. You can, justify, you can rejoice in your suffering. You can rejoice in your suffering because of who you are right now, a justified believer. And next, you can rejoice in your suffering because of what you will one day be you will be a glorified believer. Look with me at the second half of verse 2. It says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And we rejoice in our sufferings in the hope of the glory of God. Now, when I read that portion of that verse, it raises two questions. First of all, what is hope? Uh, well, when we use the word hope. What we mean by uh, uh, that is that we wish something will come to pass. We're not exactly sure that it will, but we hope uh, that, uh, that something will come to pass. Uh, we wish for it to come become a reality. Um, I, I hope I don't have another stroke. I hope, sorry Ken, that the Red Sox win the World Series this year. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope uh, that the farmers in my congregation in the Mississippi Delta, I hope that they have an abundant harvest. But none of that is guaranteed. That's not the way the Apostle Paul uses the word hope in his writings. Hope is the rock-solid confidence that we have that God will keep every promise that he has made to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hope in the New Testament is unshakable certainty in God's promises. And we can rejoice in our sufferings because we have hope in the glory of God. So we've looked at the word hope, but what about uh, that phrase, the glory of God? What is the glory of God? Well, it's his radiant splendor. We're told in Philippians, from heaven we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And what a hope that is for us who understand that our outwardly our bodies are wasting away. But that is the glory that awaits us. We will be transformed uh, by our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be transformed. Our lowly bodies will be like his glorious body. So when 
is when Paul says we, uh, we uh, hope in the glory of God, he's talking about his radiant splendor. But he's also talking about God's moral perfection. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of God's moral perfection. And one of the great hopes that is before us is that when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes again, uh, we will see him as he is and be pure as he is pure. That is one of the great hopes that await us. The struggles, the internal struggles with sin will be gone. The very desire to sin will go away, and we will be perfectly content in righteousness. Jonathan Edwards, uh, uh, if you uh, ever get the little Banner of Truth paperback, back, I think it's a paperback now, Charity and Its Fruits. Uh, uh, don't get, uh, the whole book is wonderful, but don't get bogged down in it. The very last chapter is worth uh, the uh, price alone. Heaven, a world of love. And there he reflects upon it. What awaits us in heaven? Well, there in heaven, by our Lord God and by his people, we'll be perfectly loved, perfectly loving, and perfectly lovely. And that is a hope that will sustain you in the midst of your suffering. You can rejoice in your suffering because of what you will one day be, a glorified believer. I know you've come to, uh, to, to this conference, uh, so many hurts, adversities, trials, and afflictions. I, I, I know that. I know because when I come to conferences, that's how I come. I, 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 we all share in, these, in, these, in the sufferings of our world. But the burden of the message is the burden of the Apostle Paul. You can rejoice in your sufferings. You can rejoice in your suffering because of who you are right now, a justified believer. You can rejoice in your suffering because of what you will one day be, a glorified believer. And you can rejoice in your suffering because of what you are becoming, a Christ-like believer. You can rejoice in your suffering now because you are becoming a Christ-like believer. On to verse 3. We rejoice in suffering. Now, don't misunderstand Paul. Uh, here's a place we can go off the rails. We don't want that to happen. We don't celebrate suffering. We don't seek it. Anybody that uh, seeks suffering for the sake of suffering, needs to go see a good pastor or at least a, a therapist. Uh, we don't pretend that it is inherently good. No, we rejoice because we are certain of suffering's outcome. We are certain of our Christ-likeness. Suffering shows us who we are, and we learn to depend upon God. Now let me ask another question that I hope will take us a, a little deeper into our texts. Uh, uh, what does Paul mean by suffering? What does Paul mean by suffering? Well, he means, I, I, I think, uh, of course, the suffering that is common uh, to all men and women who live in a fallen world. Common to all men and women, both non-Christian and Christian. A non-Christian uh, is killed in a car accident. A Christian is killed in a car accident. An, a, 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 an unbeliever uh, succumbs to cancer. So does a believer. A, 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 an, a, an unbeliever experiences a family uh, that is torn apart. And so does a believer. Unbelievers go through life uh, uh, suffering from depression and anxiety, and so do believers. 
That's life in a fallen world. And I tell my congregation, when you're, you can't sleep at night and you're up late at night and you're channel surfing and you uh, land on that station where the uh, minister is uh, saying that if you come to Christ, uh, you'll be uh, healthy and you'll be wealthy and, uh, uh, and everything will be uh, good for you, I tell them, keep on surfing. Uh, that, 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 that's a lie. So, so much... Uh, of the sadness that I see Christians experiencing in life is because they believe that God promised them exemption from types of suffering. And then when it comes, they believe that uh, God has let them, them down. We need to get that kind of thinking out of our mind. But here's what we do need to remember about suffering. And here's where I think Paul is taking us. When you become a Christian, listen carefully, when you become a Christian, not only do you continue to experience the sufferings uh, that are a part of living in a fallen world, you get a whole new set of suffering uh, that comes from following the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A whole new set of sufferings. Before you became a Christian, uh, you didn't pay any attention to your thought life about your uh, lust, your sinful anger. Uh, uh, you didn't think, uh, think at all about those things. But now you've become a Christian and you know you've got to crucify those sinful desires. And that crucifixion is hard and it is painful. It is a part of the suffering that comes from following the Savior, Jesus Christ. Before you were a, a, a Christian, uh, you may have been in business, and you cut ethical corners. Uh, you did whatever it took to get to the top. You might have sacrificed your family along the way. Well, then you become a Christian, and you've got to reorganize your entire life. Gospel priorities must uh, take over. And many times, those priorities are different from the priorities you once had. And those priorities can lead to suffering. I remember a, 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 a software engineer in, in one of my churches. Uh, he uh, was very successful, an independent contractor, went in, did contract work, was paid lots of money for it. And he was working for one particular company, finished up a very successful uh, worldwide project, and he was given his next task. Uh, which was to design systems for a hotel company uh, that would distribute pornography worldwide. And without even a moment's hesitation, he turned in his resignation and left, and left behind a large paycheck and went home to tell his family that their lifestyle was going to be very, very different. You see, when you become a Christian, those old problems common to the entire world, uh, 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 they continue to be your problems. They continue to produce suffering in your life, but following Jesus Christ brings you a whole new set of suffering. Uh, 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 you remember, uh, uh, perhaps, before you were a Christian, that you organized relationships uh, to achieve your goals. Uh, uh, you like to hang out with friends who told you how wonderful you are and you tell them how wonderful they are. Uh, you shared uh, uh, common goals, uh, common recreations. You organized your life around those friendships and simply avoided people uh, that didn't share those things. Well, then you become a Christian. And what does God do? He puts you right in the middle of a church full of people that are very different from you. <laughs> and it uh, takes hard work uh, to learn how to live with people very different from you that don't share your rec recreations, uh, that don't share your political views, uh, uh, that, that don't share uh, uh, many of the interests that you have. And you've got to learn to bear their burdens, to be patient. Uh, you have to learn to, uh, uh, to establish trust, and oftentimes that's one of the most painful things that I see new pastors going to congregations having to learn, how to learn to live with people very different from themselves. <laughs>
Uh, uh, so, suffering. Uh, Paul's especially concerned in his writings with the sufferings that become ours when we follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we wouldn't have it any other way. There's the joy of knowing Jesus, of walking with him, and also the joy that comes from knowing that as we rejoice in our sufferings, we are becoming more and more like our Savior Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him uh, 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 endured the cross, despising its shame. Now let's dig in a little deeper and ask what is God doing uh, in, in our uh, sufferings? Well, suffering uh, produces, look again at verses 3 through 5, we're told there that suffering produces endurance. You can handle whatever life throws at you. Uh, you, you learn that uh, as you move forward in your suffering, putting one foot in front of the other, moving forward. Then we're told, look again, uh, suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Uh, the J.B. Phillips translation translates that as uh, produces mature character. John Stott says, the character not of the untested recruit, uh, but of the soldier who has been proven in, in battle. That's what you're becoming, a veteran in God's school of suffering. And then there's, uh, then look again at the text. What is God doing? Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. There's that word hope again. Hope, the rock-solid confidence that the God who has sustained you in the past and who will sustain you in the future is sustaining you right now in the midst of your uh, sufferings. And he will, because look again at verse 5. He will, because hope does not put us to shame. Or as the older translation says, hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, ha who has been given to us. Here's what's happening in our sufferings, and I know you've come here Come to this place, each one of you. There are things that, are, uh, that you're experiencing in your life that it are causing pain and anguish and heartache. It might be stresses in the relationships that you have and uh, the area that God has sent you to serve. Uh, it uh, may, may be stresses in your marriage, problems with your children, uh, uh, your health might be uh, sli slipping away, uh, as we'll see in another one of my messages. It might just be the heartache, uh, as I heard the bishop talk, the heartache of seeing society just unravel uh, in a godly person that produces uh, suffering. Uh, here's what we want to remember, that in that suffering, God is producing our Christ-likeness. Uh, you remember um, uh, uh, reading about Hudson Taylor and about how he would have missionary candidates come and sit down in front of him. So you want to be a missionary, and uh, and uh, he would uh, take the um, he 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 would uh, he would place a, a, a tea kettle and two teacups in front of the candidate, and uh, then he would pour the uh, tea into the uh, cups. Then he'd take his fist and slam it right down on the table, and the tea would slosh out. And then he would tell the missionary candidate uh, uh, that when I struck that table, only what was in that cup came out of the cup. And you need to understand that adversity was like my, the blow of my fist. When adversity strikes you, it's going to bring out of you what's inside. Uh, and, and so... Uh, it, Adversity strikes you, and you're angry, and you're bitter, and you're frustrated. What should you do? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because you're showing me what's in my heart and giving me the opportunity to repent and relying upon the Holy Spirit to become more 
and more like you. Thank you, Jesus. And then uh, that adversity comes and it hits you hard and you speak words of love. You're content in God's providence. Your life is, uh, uh, is filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. What do you say? Thank you, Jesus. You've been at work in my life. Thank you for these evidences of your grace. So our suffering's always, always bringing out what's in our heart. You can rejoice in your suffering because of who you are right now, a justified believer, a glorified believer, and a believer who is growing in Christ's likeness. Now, as we wrap up this morning, I want to take you back some 350 years uh, to a jail in Bedford, England. And I want to take you to a particular cell there, a very small cell, and I want you to notice the furniture. There's a bed, there's a chair, and there's a desk. And then you go back and you look at that chair again and say there's something not right with that chair. And that's because one of its legs is missing. And the missing leg of that chair tells you something about that inmate. His name was John Bunyan. John Bunyan spent 12 years in that uh, 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 chair, uh, I mean in that cell. He spent 12 year, years there. And he could have walked away any time he wanted to. All he had to do was tell the warden, I will not preach the gospel. That's all he had to do. And he could have walked away and gone back to his family, to his precious blind daughter. He could have gone back to them. All he had to do was say, I won't preach. And that was the one thing he could not promise. And so he stayed there for 12 long years. Now, what about that chair leg? Well, uh, he experienced his suffering in that terrible place, uh, but he turned that prison into a place of praise. Uh, he removed the chair leg, and he carved for himself a flute, and he played music to the glory of God. And he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote tracts, sermons that would be read by others. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress, how many Christians have found sustaining hope reading a Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, all of this uh, uh, from a man who learned to turn his prison into a place of praise. He rejoiced in his suffering. Now, you, you, you say, well, that, that's a, an amazing story. What an amazing testimony. And it is. It's a testimony of a man who learned uh, 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 to rejoice in his suffering and that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. It's a remarkable story. But it can be your story too. And it will be your story as you take to heart Paul's words and believe him when he says that you can rejoice in your suffering knowing that your suffering, the suffering that you're experiencing right now, produces endurance. And endurance is producing your Christ-like character. And character produces hope for you. You'll never be put to shame because in the midst of your suffering, uh, God is pouring his love into your heart through the Holy Spirit whom he has given you. We rejoice in our sufferings, and let us pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, uh, in the moment of silence that will follow now, I pray that those brothers and sisters that are gathered here, uh, that they might come before you with their sufferings and name them one by one and ask for your sustaining grace, and grant them joy, I pray. Uh, hear their prayers, that with Paul they might rejoice in their suffering.
So pray silently now. Our God in heaven, we praise you for the encouragement that you give us from the word that we hear with our outward ear. We praise you for the encouragement that comes from the Holy Spirit uh, that has granted to us a love for you and a love for your people. And we uh, praise you for the encouragement that you give us at this enrichment conference as our brothers and sisters gather around us and by their word and examples and prayers, encourage us uh, to rejoice in our sufferings. We pray now that as we go to uh, share in a meal together, that you'll bless the food. May it strengthen our bodies so that we'll be prepared for our service this afternoon. Uh, we want to especially thank you for the food and the loving hands that have prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And